Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome Dr. Dion Claywall uh, to the table. She's a longtime core faculty member here um, in the School of Human Development. Woo -woo. She is in our San Jose campus, um, and she's actually been doing a lot of really, really amazing work um, as it relates to you were put it on the um, umbrella of andragogy as it relates to how do we best train adults to do a variety of different things. And she just really uh, left some amazing research that she's going to speak about today, rapid prototyping. But this feeds into some of the more global work that Dion does for both the institution um, and for the San Jose campus and directly for her students. And so uh, she kind of merges these little pieces, but they exist as independent pieces. And so uh, it's exciting to hear this next chapter of rapid prototyping. So without further ado, Dion Claywell. Yahoo! Thank you, Dion. So I want to um, let you know, ooh, I think you all see me really big now. Um, <laughs> I'd, let, I'd like you to um, know that a couple of my colleagues um, from the Costa Rica trip um, are on the call. One I know for sure is Kelly Haynes Mendez, and um, she's from TCS. And um, the whole reason that we even had the conference in Costa Rica at the University for Peace is because it was her project that got all of us faculty, myself from Pacific Oaks and then several from Saybrook and several from TCS, um, to Costa Rica to the University for Peace. So I want to welcome Kelly um, on the call and um, if there's questions at the end that have to do with um, the UPS program that, um, that she started that I'm kind of second generation in, then, then um, maybe we can do that. Um, also on the call might be Esmeralda Bolaños. Um, she's the program coordinator of the UPS programs, and she um, hopefully is calling in all the way from Costa Rica. So if she's here, then I welcome Esmeralda. So um, here we go. So I don't know what you can see. Can you see my slide? Yes. yes. Okay, cool. So. I chose, I chose this image because this really is what um, design thinking and rap rapid prototyping is like. There's all these connections. So you can have circles of conversation, you can have connectors, you can have flowers and petals. To me, this looks like a, a little bit like a quilt, and I'm a quilter. So, um, and if this was a quilt, it would be called double wedding ring design, which is all about love. And um, so I think that's true for this uh, presentation and the kinds of things that I've been doing since um, coming back from the Costa Rica conference and trip. Um, my presentation today is called The Power of Rapid Prototyping for 21st Century Non-Traditional Adult Learners. And my computer is not shifting to the next slide. So, let's see. Hmm. There we go. So, first what happened? Well, I was invited, I applied, and then I attended um, the Education Beyond Borders program called Global Education for the 21st Century, and that was um, offered by the Center for Executive Education, and we met at the United Nations University for Peace campus in Costa Rica in March. The photos here um, are a couple of, of um, beautiful elements of that campus. Um, this peace monument that you see in the upper two pictures are, um, it's a huge monument. It's the largest monument to peace on the planet, um, as I recall. And then the bottom is a screen grab from a video. So if you wanted to know more about University for Peace, then um, go ahead and Google UPeace, a campus in nature, and it'll pop up for you um, in YouTube. At this conference, um, we did a lot of different things, but specific to this presentation, I learned a little bit about the Earth Charter, which is a declaration of fundamental principles for building a just, sustainable, and peaceful society now. And that ties in beautifully with the meaning of the PO degree four primary elements of this charter which um, absolutely tie into what we do at PO is in terms of our mission and core values is we respect and care for the community of life, we have ecological integrity, we have social and economic justice, 
and we believe in democracy, nonviolence, and peace. Um, in terms of 21st century learners, what we're talking about, the needs um, for those learners, has to do with needing to um, provide a multi multi-dimensional learning environment and a learning environment that not only walks the talk of but also models skills for cultural humility. What I experienced was absolutely amazing and wonderful. The mural here um, that you can see in the bottom right hand corner is, I don't know, maybe it's 50 feet long and 20 feet wide. It is absolutely huge. It just welcomes you as you walk into the foyer of the uh, university space. And it really is an image for me of what it means to um, educate for global, global citizenship. Um, some of the things that I experienced were um, a wide variety of practical approaches that I could implement in my classrooms or that I can train for in my mentor program here in Northern California. Um, I was encouraged to expand my practice by visioning and creating new learning experiences and that's actually the outcome that I want to talk about um, specifically today. We talked a lot about competencies for innovative thinking and what this requires is an openness to others' perspectives and it is also very important that people learn how to interact with others in order to share those perspectives. So one of the other things we learned about is design thinking and design thinking is a thing and um, it is a human-centered approach to innovation. It's, it's human-centered because we're looking at problems or situations from the lens of humanity. Um, and how can we better um, include other people's perspectives to try to grapple with the nature of the problem and come up with viable solutions? Um, it is a process. It is also a mindset. It's a way of working. And so what we are asked to do in this conference as an outcome is to apply design thinking to our work as 21st century educators. So when I got home, I had a different way of thinking about my classroom, and I began to experiment with a few different ways of engaging my students. I used inquiry more. Um, I shared responsibility for learning with my students more. If they um, weren't well prepared, then I can use some inquiry around that. And by using inquiry, what got in the way of your preparing more fully for class, I learned more about the students. I learned more about their context for learning and their context around their own sense of responsibility and efficacy as a learner. So that led to a deeper sense of shared responsibility. And in the end, students were empowered. They were empowered to step up to the plate. They started um, engaging a little bit more. As a result of all of that, I was able to alter my frame of reference for teaching and learning. So from the global perspective, one of the things that um, I've always held in my thinking is to think globally and act locally. And in this conference, I was challenged by several of my new colleagues and friends to think locally and act globally. So now I'm looking at both of those two elements in, um, in how I approach conversations in the classroom. Um, I'm also in adding some global engagement concepts, testing those out in some of our classroom conversations. I routinely ask students um, on the first day of our first meeting, our first class meeting, where people uh, were born and raised, what languages they speak, and, um, and how they got here to the Bay Area. And in so doing, um, we really discover extremely quickly within, within about an hour that it is, each classroom really is a global environment. And so what I'm doing, therefore, is challenging my students to act in ways that hopefully expands their impact on others when they know, oh my goodness, they're in a global environment just by being in the classroom. This bench here is one of several benches. It's a bench of dreams. And um, I don't remember the story of how these benches came to be, but it was really wonderful to sit on these benches and dream and think about the content, think about the conference, think about the conversations that I was having with my new friends and colleagues at the conference and look out over this huge expanse, the entire valley of, of um, Costa Rica, 
um, from high above the city of San Jose and then all the way across actually to the other side where the volcanoes are. Um, so I really had a huge field in which to um, place my dreams and it was it was great. It was really enlivening and it was fun. So I knew that I needed to apply some change and I do have a project that I'm doing that I've, I've shared with um, the HD department around our BA capstone course. But then something else popped up um, in our Praxis course in 604. And this was on our last class weekend. Um, I had an opportunity and so I took it. So to give you some background, the course description um, is pretty heavy. Um, we're taking a look at the placement of a person within the context of Bronfenbrenner's ecological model. So we put the person in the center and then there's all these influences, all these different levels and layers of influences that not only are on the individual but also the individual's behaviors and um, choices have influences outward as well. Then the chrono system is the dimension of time, what happens now versus later versus before versus in the future. So. Um, the students have an opportunity in this class to develop their own theoretical and methodolo methodological framework for working with children and families in a diverse world. And that's the piece that I hooked onto after coming back from Costa Rica um, that led to a really wonderful outcome. So my praxis, my action plan um, within the midst of this course um, was that for the third class weekend, I added design thinking um, to a post-presentation discussion. So they had already completed all their class requirements. It was Sunday afternoon. They had finished their, their presentation Sunday morning. We'd had a nice shared lunch together. And now we were in the process of spending the last three hours for wrapping up the course and sending them on their way into field work. So um, to let you know, the elements of de design thinking are first to present a design challenge to the students, then to engage them in ideation, to set the stage for them to collaboratively visualize and brainstorm from multiple perspectives, some potential solutions or some thinking around that design challenge. And then after that, to engage them in rapid prototyping, which is the sharing of solutions. And it's really important in the rapid prototyping to not allow any constraints of time, money, and resources. If you want to know more about design thinking, this was actually originated by David Kelly. And he is the founder of the Institute of Design at Stanford. Um, and if you Google it, you might take a look at the D School, which is what it's um, known as now. So the challenge that I gave them is that I asked students, and again, this is after lunch, their biorhythms are a little bit low, so it's a good time to do some reflection. I asked students to quietly think about their case study person that they had presented about and worked with all semester, to think about that person's elders, and to think about um, what could those elders experience in the community to promote the, health, the healthy development of the elder in order to promote the healthy development of the child or the young person that they had done their case study on. And when they were ready, I asked them to write their ideas on the board. I gave them five minutes for that, and the board was covered. In the ideation, ideation um, step, which was right away after it, I asked them to collaboratively visualize and brainstorm from multiple perspectives. So the way that I got the multiple perspectives to happen is I had everybody find a partner, and I gave them each, each pair of partners two minutes to just have a very short conversation to share their ideas about the design challenge. How could they and why should they support an elder's development in order to promote the development of younger people in the community? And then I had them switch. So they actually had five short conversations over about 15 minutes. So they were sharing and also listening to five different people and getting then a huge variety of multiple perspectives. And as I was listening to the students, their ideas were shifting as they spoke to different people. And those ideas were becoming more feasible, they were becoming more interesting, and the students were getting more excited. The volume in the room was actually increasing. And by the fifth conversation, 
they didn't hear my um, my chime bells. I had to like go in the middle of the glump and um, get them to <laughs> get them to settle down and, and move forward. So then the so then the third part is the rapid prototyping. So everybody was in the middle of the room. We had pushed the tables out to the side for this this um, walking brainstorm. So we actually stayed there in the center of the room. I had them find each pair of partners. I had them find another pair so that they could make groups of four. And I told them that they had a very supportive city mayor and a million dollar grant. And um, what were they gonna do with it given the ideations and the ideas that they had previously put up onto the board? So um, we got a lot of ideas that again were feasible. Some of these ideas actually do happen in real life. Others could happen. Others are happening on a smaller scale, but could be scaled up. And um, it was very exciting that we, we only took about 10 minutes for that. Then I asked, and this was the clincher, and I did not plan to ask this. It just kind of flew out of my mouth because I think we had such good training on design challenge experiences that was very emergent in Costa Rica. So I think I just was kind of on that wave and just kind of followed what I had experienced in the um, conference in Costa Rica. So what I asked the group is who's interested in and who's willing to act on any of these solutions in real life. And what I was thinking what about was that the next semester now this summer, I have them all for field work. And as I was looking at what was on the board, I thought, man, we could do some of these as a fieldwork project. And we could do some of these projects in small groups. And we could even have one project and we have different groups who are handling different pieces of the project. So my mind was just reeling with possibilities and ideas. So we did a quick tally and for every single idea that was up on the board between 10 and 14 students felt energized toward action. So here's what our board looked like. It was, it was covered with, with ideas and um, even after I took this photo, there was more added to the board to make connections. Um, but here are the suggestions that they came up with and this is a bit of a content analysis for, for what was up there. But, they decided that senior centers should provide many more resources than they typically do. They decided that elder care caregivers needed to be um, trained in diversity and lifespan development, as well as family systems theory. They decided that seniors needed to have opportunities to volunteer in preschools, um, NICU, or the Grandpa Harry program is um, a preschool where there was a grandpa for the afternoon program. Um, we also thought that there needed to be technology training um, for our seniors provided in the person's home language because the person learns best in their native language, especially when there's some learning stress going on. Um, we also thought that, you know, people, seniors have a difficult time getting around and, and maybe they're living on fixed income. So, yeah, they should take Uber and Lyft and that's a good thing, um, but maybe they should have some discounts or there should be some donations to offset some of those transportation costs so that the seniors can get to the technology training, they can get to the preschool, they can get to the senior center. And then last, and this was a lot of fun, they thought about all of the school buses that sit empty in the summertime and they decided wouldn't it be great for those seniors to go on field trips to various places and on a school bus that might enliven some of their earlier days and encourage storytelling. So this is my group of students for that particular class and um, I asked them after all of this exciting stuff which didn't take long. I asked them to um, sit down and write a little bit and I asked them to reflect on the design challenge experience and the rapid prototyping that they'd just been through and I said what's it to you? Um, what have you gotten out of this experience? Um, and then when I looked at their papers and, and pulled out the main themes of what they talked about these are the four or five things that they talked most about. They talked about having a renewed and very respectful value of elders in the community. They um, felt empowered themselves to address the needs of elders, as opposed to just shaking their head and saying, oh, no, no, that's not how it should be. So they felt a sense of movement in their own intentions. Um, some students actually wrote statements of commitment 
to act in ways to promote lifespan development for people of all ages. Um, specifically for one student, she said, I have a couple of grandmas who bring in the children to my preschool environment. I think I'm going to invite them to stay a little while. I'm going to invite them to read the story. I'm going to invite them to participate in the classroom. And um, then there was several students who said, could we do something with elders in field work next semester? And of course I said yes. So what came out of that is one student out of the 15 actually did say that she was going to um, change her project from preschool environment to an elder care environment. So specifically she's noticing that um, she doesn't know very much about the systems of care for elders um, and she doesn't know why there are inequi inequities in that care. So she wants to learn about that. She has a lot of questions that she has for that. Um, in another um, assignment a few days later in this fieldwork class, um, I asked students to think about um, what do they want to get out of this and, what if, and how does it relate to social change. And um, so she recognized that she had limited and negative experience with elderly care and that she felt that this was an opportunity for her to advocate for consistent and quality care for seniors. So she's taking a negative experience and turning it on end in order to become an advocate and you know part of the solution and not part of the problem. And then in another reflection which is just a few days ago I asked people to talk about, you know, what are your thoughts now that you've started your fieldwork project? And she's really excited. Um, she appreciates the structure in the class, as she says, but um, she sees this as a very loving opportunity for her um, and also an opportunity for her to learn about a part of her community that, um, A, again, she had a negative perspective on, but B, that she wants to now engage with in order to bring positive social change. So, that is the power of rapid prototyping. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions or comments? I can't see you anymore, but there's Marsha. There's Donald. I, uh, Anybody have any comments or questions? I can't see you. So, um, Carrie, could you moderate for me, please? And choose people so I can hear them. Yeah, and this is Pat. I had a question. Um, I, first of all, let me just say how much I appreciate that approach. It sounds fascinating. I was wondering if you think it would work in other classes as well. Absolutely. Oh, of course. Absolutely, of course. Um, rapid prototyping is, um, is about brainstorming, but it's about brainstorming in a particular way. Um, with some particular social structures around the um, the structure of the brainstorm. So it needs to, the design challenge needs to be tangible, it needs to matter to people, you need to bring people to the table who have some background and expertise so that um, the ideas and the ideation stuff is actually um, on track as opposed to um, pie in the sky. So there's a little bit of a reality focus that's important there, um, but absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And the ideas that the students came up with are, are you know, are exciting. It just yeah. some of them seem so simple to do, others more complicated and expensive, but they certainly have a great array of possibilities. Absolutely. And because of that array, that I think is part of why I thought, you know, we could do some of this in field work. It's not rocket science. Um, some of it we start real small scale. You know, you have one preschool and one senior center. One of the students actually knows of a senior center that is right next door to a preschool. She happens to know the director of the preschool. And she asked the director, did you ever go next door? And the director had never been next door. So something just as opening the thinking door um, is going to maybe create some positive change and create a whole new set of programs for both program for both centers. We'll see. So Thank on you. one note, the, the class that we're talking about is the, the class of 15 that are the contract from 
first five West Ed, Santa Clara County. So they are having their program fully paid for um, and they have a sense of, um, they, they want to be able to give back. So I, I'm not surprised that they took to this idea so readily um, and are looking at how they can make sure that their, their learning and their contribution back to Santa Clara County is, um, is something that they are really dedicated to. Yeah, and I appreciate that they have a lifespan approach to that too, which is something that emerged over the course of this particular class. Donald? I just wanted to add really quickly uh, that this, and how I was doing the introduction, this is kind of the value of the professional development dollars that we uh, dedicate as an institution uh, to our faculty to be able to go and engage in this type of scholarship, but then bring it back and demonstrate how it's useful um, in the classroom. We'll be using some of this information to build up on um, our fieldwork program, as we were saying how we're trying to align it more with what MFT's practicum program looks like. Um, this type of academic work and connecting classes together um, come out of this professional development framework. And so, um, as I stated earlier, being able to take these small different projects and bring them together to synergize great change is really exciting. So um, thank you, Gina. Sure. Anything else from anybody? Kelly, if you're still on the call, is there anything you wanted to say? Sure. Um, it, it was such a, a pleasure, Dion. I'll put my camera on. It was such a pleasure to see you um, talking about and discussing some of the things that we uh, reviewed in Costa Rica. And I'll just reiterate what Dr. Grant is saying that I think that these types of professional development opportunities are really beneficial not only to the individual faculty, but to the campus as well. So this particular project was sponsored by um, the Office of Global Engagement through TCSEF. Um, and we are working and planning to offer the program again within the next academic year. So hopefully you'll see some announcements and notifications coming around for that in the fall. Hi, Hi, Dr. Davis. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> Anything else, anybody? Thank you, Dion. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, everybody.